Vince Russo signed a contract with WCW on October the 3rd, 1999. Russo had been plucked from obscurity in WWE thanks to his hugely entertaining articles in WWE magazine under the pen name of Vic Venom. His standout writing style was recognised by Vince McMahon and the New York native was promoted to WWE's creative team in 1996. Russo was hailed as one of the driving forces behind WWE's fresh new attitude that had helped them to overcome the odds and come back from the very brink of destruction in their war with WCW. As Vince McMahon looked to capitalise on this newfound success, he introduced a second weekly television programme in the form of Smackdown in 1999 and Russo decided that the added pressure of writing a second TV show would adversely affect his family life and decided to leave WWE for good. And so, in October 1999, everyone from WCW's executives through to their die-hard fans were hopeful that Vince Russo was going to be the man to plug the gaping holes in the starboard bow and stop the ship from rapidly sinking as he was signed to a contract with them. In less than a year and a half, WCW was gone and Vince Russo was blamed for it, becoming one of wrestling's most hated men. It was as if all of a sudden WWE could do no wrong. From 1998 onwards, Vince McMahon's wrestling federation was becoming a white hot property. The federation was rising like a phoenix from the ashes after 83 weeks of being thrashed every Monday night by WCW in the ratings and almost going out of business. They'd finally found their new direction, their attitude. By October 1999, WCW was in a bad way. As fast as WCW had risen to prominence in 1996 and 1997 to almost putting Vince McMahon out of business, its decline was even faster. The wheels were off the product and WCW needed a miracle if they were to turn the tide back in their favour in this wrestling war. Eric Bischoff was the man that had brought WCW to the battlefield in the first place. Until mid-1999, he was considered to be the driving force that had brought wrestling back to the masses, and thanks to his masterstroke in the NWO, he'd actually managed to make wrestling cool. It took a while for the WWE to catch on, but eventually Vince and Co. took the most successful ideas from WCW and ECW and ran with them to produce a product that was better than both of them combined. WWE's Attitude Era felt even hotter than those glory years in the mid to late 80s when Hulk Hogan was running wild. Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock were the Hogan and Randy Savage for the flippant, sarcastic late 90s. The Attitude Era wasn't written by a single author, however. Instead, it was the teamwork of a group of creative visionaries edited by one boss in Vince McMahon. Everyone made an effort and chipped in, including the wrestlers, the commentators and several staff writers, including the likes of Chris Kresge, Ed Ferrara and Vince Russo. Eric Bischoff couldn't come up with ideas quick enough to counter WWE's white-hot product. While everyone was banding together backstage in WWE for the common cause, WCW's backstage environment was in disarray. The talents were all out for themselves. Eric Bischoff was becoming burned out in a shell of his former self, and so there was no single boss making the final decisions and in a move that always leads to disaster in pro wrestling, the job of writing the show was given to the wrestlers themselves. Eric Bischoff was booted out the door by Turner officials as ratings started to swirl the drain, and now they needed a creative tour de force to come in and fix things. Surely, Vince Russo could work the same magic in WCW as he had for WWE, who were in this position just a few short years earlier. 
Vince Russo at the time was burned out and unhappy with his work-life balance in WWE. He was missing important life events with his children and wife while writing Vince McMahon's wrestling shows. Since Russo had started writing for WWE, he'd seen the company triple its revenue to over $250 million, while his own pay packet included $350,000 alongside occasional payments from Vince McMahon for being a good boy. When Russo confronted McMahon about the imbalance and requested a $1 million salary, McMahon dismissively suggested Russo hire a babysitter to look after his children. It was three weeks after Bischoff had been fired. WCW was rudderless, and for Russo, it was a case of right place, right time when he put the feelers out to WCW's upper management. They were very interested in hiring Russo to control their output. Russo bagged himself a two-year deal as creative director of WCW. Vince McMahon reacted angrily to Russo's rash decision. He saw Russo as a surrogate son of sorts and McMahon felt like he'd been stabbed in the back by him. It would turn out that Vince Russo, without Vince McMahon's control, would be deadly for the wrestling business. Russo's writing partner, Ed Ferrara, also came along for the ride and signed a contract of his own with WCW. As they took over the reins of the company, rather than gradually introducing changes to WCW's product in order to not alienate the remaining fanbase, they decided to radically change almost everything immediately. Outside of the NWO, one of the major components of WCW that made it a success during the mid to late 90s and made it stand out against WWE was the Cruiserweight division. The high-flying division of smaller wrestlers was a showcase of thrilling athleticism, and it truly set WCW apart from WWE at the time. Many pay-per-view events were opened with a stellar cruiserweight contest. It was usually an explosive and dramatic way to kick off a show. The division often included a diverse roster of international talent from Mexico to Japan through to Europe, and at the time, it was like nothing else ever presented on mainstream American wrestling TV programming. There were no complaints from the fans who were enthralled by these athletic displays. Vince Russo didn't like it, however, so it had to go. In an interview, he said, I'm going to tell you something right now that you will absolutely not agree with, but I've been a wrestling fan my whole life and I will live and die by this. It's hard enough, believe me. I write this shit, it's hard enough to get somebody over. You will never, ever, 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 ever see the Japanese wrestlers or the Mexican wrestlers over in American mainstream wrestling. And the simple reason for that is, even myself, I'm an American and I don't want to sound like a big bigot or a racist or anything like that, but I'm an American. If I'm watching wrestling here in America, I don't give a shit about a Japanese guy. I don't give a shit about a Mexican guy, I'm from America and that's what I want to see. An utterly infuriating quote if I've ever read one and a blatant example of Russo mirroring his own tastes and opinions onto the entire wrestling audience. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. Russo was convinced that the internet had completely changed the wrestling business and that the business had to respond to it, he said. What really changed the wrestling business was the internet. I was screaming to the WWF five years ago and nobody wanted to listen to me. They would always come back to me and say, oh well, there's only one computer in every 20,000 households. My argument would be, oh yeah, there's one computer, but what happens when little Johnny goes onto the internet and gets kayfabe information? You're going to tell me that the next day little Johnny doesn't go to school and tell 15 of his friends? Of course, Russo was talking absolute nonsense. The vast majority of the fan base has always been casual fans who really couldn't care any less about what's going on backstage. It was true then, and it's even true today in a world where everyone has the internet in their pocket. More to the point, us hardcore fans who do read about the inner workings of the wrestling business with fascination, and there will be a lot of you watching this video, I'm sure you can agree that the last thing we want to watch is a confusing mix of real life and fiction every Monday night, which is exactly what Russo presented as he took control of WCW's booking. 
In a radio interview, Russo had spoken highly of Buff Bagwell, apparently leading to rumours that he was going to get a massive push, and so a segment was booked in which Bagwell broke the fourth wall, deliberately lost a match to La Parker, then got on the mic and asked, Hey Russo, did I do a good job for you? With the emphasis being on job, it must have been absolutely baffling for the millions of casual fans still watching the product. One of the most memorable of these shoot angles came further down the line at Bash at the Beach 2000. Jeff Jarrett was booked to defend the WCW title against Hulk Hogan. The backstage rumour was that Russo wanted Hogan to do the job and loose to Jarrett, but Hogan was having none of it. What played out on pay-per-view was a confusing mess. Jarrett laid down in the middle of the ring and Hogan covered him with his foot. Jarrett stormed out looking angry. Later on, Russo came out and cut a rambling promo on Hogan, calling him a politician and telling him he got what he wanted. Honestly, it was headache inducing to watch as a fan and a massive turn off. Over 20 years later, and nobody seems to be able to comprehensively say whether this was a shoot or a work or a bit of both. Russo and his writing partner Ed Ferrara's obsession with writing wrestling shows that blurred the line between fiction and the real life politics of the wrestling business took a cruel turn as they introduced the character of Oklahoma to WCW television. Oklahoma was Ed Ferrara mocking Jim Ross, who was the lead commentator on WWE at the time. JR had suffered a horrible attack of Bell's palsy, a condition that paralysed his face a year earlier. And that was enough for Russo and Ferrara to bully him via their TV show. Ferrara, as Oklahoma, mimicked JR's condition by pulling a face, wearing a cowboy hat and mocking his accent. JR was understandably upset. They knew about when I got sick the last time. I got Bell's palsy just a few hours after my mother passed away. That was a real sudden death and I was a long way from home when it happened. I thought those guys understood that better because they were working here when all that occurred. But I guess it just didn't make any difference to them. In line with Russo's beliefs about the Cruiserweight division, Oklahoma even embarrassingly won the Cruiserweight Championship. And it's no surprise, considering Russo's attitudes generally towards wrestling championship belts. He certainly didn't ingratiate himself to traditional fans with his decree that those titles are merely props. Under Russo's booking, the World Heavyweight Championship changed hands over 20 times, devaluing the belt massively. Title changes, however, wouldn't be the only thing to devalue the once prestigious WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Russo managed to drag movie star and wrestling fan David Arquette down with him to become one of the industry's most despised individuals, as he made the actor with no former wrestling experience the WCW champion. WCW was now owned by Time Warner, whose movie division produced the absolutely atrocious and insulting Ready to Rumble film that appealed to absolutely nobody. Eric Bischoff had set the wheels in motion for this train wreck to be produced just before he was fired in September 1999, and by the time of his rehiring in the spring of 2000, the film was ready to be released. We'll come back to Bischoff's rehiring in just a moment. As Ready to Rumble was about to be released, Russo decided that Arquette would become a focal point of the main event storyline. As WWE continued to trounce WCW in the ratings, Russo decided that hot-shotting title changes was the way to spike interest in the product. It would be one of Russo's biggest mistakes, as on an episode of Thunder, B-list actor David Arquette won the WCW World Heavyweight Championship in order to promote the new movie. Bret Hart weighed in on the title win, saying, I think that anyone who really had a passion for this business or the profession sees it as a joke. It's an insult to everybody who ever really busted their ass. Kevin Sullivan said, David Arquette winning the world title? Boy, Scott Hall never won the title. Scott Hall never won the World Heavyweight Championship. But David Arquette did. Can you tell me what's wrong? In hindsight, it's decisions like this that spell out WCW's death. 
it's easy to see why Russo gets directly attributed towards sinking WCW. And of course, nothing was learned, as incredibly, Russo booked himself to win the very same championship later in the year when he beat Booker T on a September 2000 episode of Nitro. On Russo, Eric Bischoff said, he may have had a few segments in WWE talking about the magazine, but he was not a character or personality that people really knew. To interject himself and put himself in there as much as we did was a huge mistake. Vince got a huge case of, I need to be on camera. He desperately wanted to be on camera. He desperately wanted to be a character. He couldn't help himself. In April of 2000, Time Warner executive Brad Siegel called Bischoff and rehired him to work alongside Russo. Siegel was in a bad spot. He was one of the vocal few who shouted loudly about Russo signing up with WCW in the first place and was initially very positive about it. Bischoff said that Siegel had ended up with egg all over him, having made a big decision to bring Russo in with lots of bluster about him being the saviour of WCW, and then just months later having to backtrack entirely on that decision when it became obvious that Russo was poisoning the proverbial well instead of saving it. It was hoped that Bischoff would fill the role of McMahon in WCW and keep Russo on a tight leash. About Russo, Bischoff said, There was a lot of talk, there was a lot of bluster, there was a lot of, I did this in the WWF, I did that, I was responsible for Stone Cold Steve Austin, there was a lot of that. But when it came down to sitting down in a room and saying, okay, what should we do, the ideas were very juvenile, they were dark, they had no logic. Most of it was nonsensical, which is why, by the way, they brought me back. Brad Siegel did not want to risk his political capital bringing me back unless he absolutely had to. Even Brad realised in short order, everybody realised that Vince was basically nothing but bullshit. There was nothing under the hood and that's when Brad called me back. Russo did such a terrible job of WCW creative that a conspiracy theory swirled around the industry that he was actually sent to WCW by Vince McMahon as a Trojan horse, tasked with destroying it from the inside. However, some of Russo's thinking made sense at a base level. He believed that everyone should have a gimmick and everyone should have something to do on the show, which was all well and good, but his execution of those ideas was absolutely appalling. Take Mike Awesome, for example. Awesome was signed to a contract with WCW, after being a huge prospect in ECW throughout the late 90s. Orson awesome was a giant of a man, lauded for his incredible high-flying ability and willingness to take huge amounts of punishment. It seemed like he was a can't-miss prospect. As Awesome arrived in WCW, Russo decided that in spite of his talents, Awesome was too boring, and so he was lumbered with the atrocious back-to-back -back gimmicks of the fat chick thriller, and then like it couldn't get any worse, that 70s guy. In the name of everyone having something to do on the card, Shane Douglas feuded with Billy Kidman over his erectile dysfunction, I kid you not. As Douglas was caught on video suffering from erectile dysfunction, it was decided that there must be a Viagra on a pole match. We also had a Judy Bangwell on a forklift match and the slightly racist Piñata on a pole match. And Russo decided to turn Goldberg heel and he even got rid of the Nitro Girls. All unbelievably poor decisions. According to the excellent Death of WCW book, during Russo's tenure, Nitro's ratings went nowhere upwards and WWE continued to thrash Nitro every week. The week Russo won the belt, Nitro drew a 2.87 rating to Raw's 5.44. Attendance fell from an average of 4,628 people per show to 3,593, due largely to the fact that the company had failed to create any new stars and had made their previous draws, such as Ric Flair and Goldberg, look like total idiots. Pay-per-view buy rates, which were the company's main revenue source, plummeted from a 0.52 rating to a 0.26. Buy rates actually halved during Russo's tenure. By October 2000, Russo's reign of terror came to an end. Russo cited that he'd received a concussion while involving himself physically 
in his own storylines. Brad Siegel took this opportunity to formally fire him. Too much damage had been done, however, the remaining six months of WCW's life would see Time Warner try and offload the ailing division. Eric Bischoff scrambled and ultimately failed to buy it, only for Vince McMahon to buy WCW for dirt cheap and take the pleasure of shutting it down for good. Luckily, nobody in the wrestling business has trusted Vince Russo with the keys to the castle ever since. Sure, he was hired by TNA for a while. Even there, you could tell the stink of Vince Russo was over the product. Also, in a decision that everyone thought was absolutely crazy at the time, WWE rehired him briefly in 2002 before realising the massive mistake they were making and immediately firing him. Once was enough. One time, Vince Russo was trusted, unleashed at the helm of a major wrestling company in the hopes that he might save it. To sink American Wrestling's once number one promotion in a year is quite the accomplishment for any so-called wrestling writer.